Hi everybody, I've been asked to prepare this pre-recorded presentation in advance of the SHAD Symposium on the 24th to 25th of May to give you a whistle-stop tour of why and how we built the River Seven Fish Passes and specifically sharing examples of the challenges we've had to face whilst building the naturalised bypass channel fish pass at Beverly Weir on the River Seven. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, you can send these through to the event organisers who will be able to pass them on. But firstly, I thought I should explain who I am, my background, and how I was lucky enough to find myself working on this project. I'm a chartered civil engineer with over 25 years experience working on construction projects. I spent the majority of my career working for the Canal and River Trust in engineering roles, specialising in building and repairing assets that are next to rivers and waterways. I joined the Unlocking the Seven delivery team in 2018 as the Trust's project engineer. I undertook a variety of roles, but my primary task has been to take the outline proposals for the fish passes, manage the detailed design process and ensure we have a buildable design, help resolve any issues found during the construction phase and perhaps most importantly, ensure that what we build meets the requirements to allow fishes, fish to use these structures. One important thing to note is that I'm not a fish pass designer. I've worked very closely with a team of experts who provide the information and guidance needed to ensure the structures work from a fisheries perspective. So why do you need a fish pass on the River Severn? During the Industrial Revolution, the River Severn became very important for carrying goods and materials. In 1824, it was noted that the river is navigable the whole way, but navigation is very much impeded by the lowness of water in summer and by floods in winter. In the 1840s, navigation on the River Severn was improved by the construction of a series of weirs and locks. This photo shows a typical weir on the River Severn. These are large structures designed to increase the depth of water upstream. The cross section um, shows that they were constructed from large rocks encased in an early form of concrete. The water level upstream is roughly two metres um, higher than the water level below. Almost immediately after the construction of the weirs, the impact on migratory fish was noted, as you can see from this quote from a fisheries report in 1862. The finest river in England is nearly ruined by building walls across it, sufficient to stop everything except a large and powerful animal. Works were undertaken to improve fish passage relatively soon after construction by the provision of notches in the weir crest to allow um, to, sorry, to give a flow of water for the fish to swim up. This worked for more powerful fish such as salmon, but didn't help weaker species such as the Twait Shad. Weirs and locks were constructed along the river in six locations, Gloucester, Upper Load, Diglas, Beverley, Holt and Lincoln. The bottom two weirs are tidal, so fish can simply swim over them at high tides. Our project is therefore focused on fish pass provision at the weirs around Worcester. So what's the target fish? By joining this event, you'll know that our target fish is the Twait Shad. The populations of this fish were devastated by the construction of the weirs, as they were not particularly strong swimmers and were unable to make it over the weir at Diglas in central Worcester. From a design perspective, by targeting the weakest swimming fish on the River Severn, it should mean that all other fish would be able to use the new fish pass. Other pre-recorded presentations have looked at how the fish pass designs were chosen on the River Severn and River Team, so I'm not going to go into the detail um, of this process. But in summary, for the weirs on the River Severn, two different types of fish pass were chosen deep vertical slots at Diglas, Holt and Lincoln, and a naturalised bypass channel at Beverley. The deep vertical slot fish passes have been used at the sites where less space was available. Both types of fish pass have a series of small steps designed so that the fish can use their burst speed to get up to the next level, catch their breath before going again. How the structures achieve this is very different, and I'll explain this in more detail across the two separate presentations. This talk is going to focus on Beverley Fish Pass. Although it's the second weir upstream, 
it was the first first fish pass that had been completed and, I, I, and I'm able to explain the key design features along with the specific challenges of building them on the following slides. The key features of the naturalised bypass channel design at fish, uh, Beverly Fish Pass are the gradient is shallower by approximately 50% than the deep vertical slots as more space was available compared to other sites. Broadly, a naturalised bypass channel needs to be twice as long as a deep vertical slot. On this plan, you can see that this has been achieved by curving the fish pass around in the space available. In this slide, you can see the fish pass has got a Reno mattress base. These are rocks encased in, wire, in a wire metal frame that allows water to flow and pass through without being washed away over time. The gaps in between will fill with silt and stones and vegetation over time, improving the wildlife habitat. Perturbation boulders. These are essential to the success of the fish pass. These boulders have been carefully designed and positioned to break up the flow of water as it passes down the fish pass. This creates a series of water chutes and eddies where the fish, fish are able to burst through and rest before continuing upstream. We needed to construct um, these boulders from concrete for two main reasons. Firstly, if you look closely, you will see that the edges of the concrete have been carefully designed to ensure that water flows through the fish pass uniformly. Natural boulders would have many variations, which could have affected how the water flows through the structure to the point where it wouldn't have worked properly as a fish pass. Secondly, the boulders are much larger than they seem, a bit like an iceberg, with much more below bed level. This is to ensure that they are big enough to withstand the forces of the flowing River Severn for at least the next 120 years. This would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve with a natural boulder. These series of photographs um, show how we constructed the perturbation boulders. Um, we started doing so by casting them in situ. Um, you can see on the first two photographs here where we've cast the base um, and then we've um, shuttered for the actual shape of the perturbation boulder itself before filling with concrete. Um, and this photo shows the completed uh, boulders before the installation of the Reno mattress base. Um, and then we, we moved to casting the, the boulders on the ground adjacent to the fish pass and lifting them in place to try and speed up the, the process of completing um, this element of the works. A piled retaining wall um, next to the existing weir was constructed to avoid damaging the existing weir and to provide flood protection during the works. This series of photos shows, um, shows the, the, the piles being installed during the construction phase. Um, the top right hand photograph here shows how close we got to the existing weir structure and how we've had to, we had to chop, um, cut a, a path through the existing concrete to allow us to install the piles. Um, and the bottom right photograph shows the, the piles installed and cut um, to their finished level. Proprietary precast concrete retaining walls called ready rock blocks were used to form the walls and support the side slopes of the fish pass. So in this photograph, you can see the, um, the modular blocks um, being stored prior to installation. Um, this is pretty much the bottom um, layer of the um, of the blocks um, installed on a lean mix concrete um, with the slope cut back temporarily um, before um, the, the wall reached its full height. Um, this is the wall um, installed with the initial backfill. You can actually see the texture on the front face of the, the blocks which gives quite a natural, natural um, stone finish to um, um, to, to, to the retaining walls and again another photo showing that um, on, on the other side um, of the fish pass. The riverbanks were protected with large stones and the new side slopes were covered in a special fabric that stops the soil washing away during a flood. 
So these two photos show the armor stone that was used um, and um, in the top right hand photo you can see where it's been placed from the bed up to the bank um, to, to provide protection against erosion. This bottom left photo shows the special fabric that we've used to protect um, the side slopes in the short term. Um, this works by grass growing through the fabric and its roots binding everything together. This works really well and as, it, and as you can see in the bottom right hand photo um, you can probably just about make out the grass starting to go through um, and that established very quickly. All these design solutions were chosen to make it as easy as possible to build in a difficult working environment. In particular we wanted to have materials that were as resistant as possible to flooding as we knew this would happen multiple times during the construction period. The site at Beverly presented a number of construction challenges that needed to be overcome. The access from the public highway was very long and needed to go down a steep slope. Works are undertaken at the start of the project to construct an access route for all the construction plant and material deliveries needed to build the fish pass. And this extended over a kilometre from the A449 um, where the, the red marker is travelling across multiple different um, um, fields and farmland <clears throat> before going down the steep slope, turning through more than 90 degree bend, then across the floodplain to the works location. The Fish Pass and Access Road were built on a site of important archaeological interest. All the excavation works were supervised by a team of, of, of archaeologists. We did find some interesting timbers during the excavation of the Fish Pass which you can make out on the bottom right hand photograph um, shown by the ranging rod. We believe they were related to the construction of the weir in the 1840s. Keeping it dry, being next to a live river meant we needed to stop water coming into the works area. We did this by building a temporary cofferdam using steel sheet piles above the upstream inlet of the fish pass. On completion of the works, these were cut at riverbed level and removed by a team of specialist divers. So again, you can see this series of photos from top left show the cofferdam at the bottom below the fish, below the uh, the weir and at the bottom of the fish pass. The top right um, is the cofferdam that's protecting the inlet um, upstream end of the fish pass. The bottom left hand photo is showing that dewatered with a fish pass constructed uh, below it um, immediately before we were ready to cut out the piles, the cofferdam piles. Um, and the bottom right hand photo shows that area of um, area being flooded before we used a team of divers to go in um, and cut, burn away the piles to allow them to be removed. We have very poor ground conditions. The soils um, that form the side slopes of the fish pass were not very strong and suffered from slumping after a flood event, which you can see on both of these photos. You can see where water's come into the fish pass, where it's been underwater and it's, and it's washed away our, our temporary um, side slopes during the construction phase. It was difficult to install the piles for the retaining wall and bridge abutments due to high bedrock levels and it being a hard material. We learned some lessons during um, the construction of this fish pass that were used during the build for the others. We also needed to pile next to an existing um, adjacent listed bridge. We had to ensure that we didn't cause any damage to the bridge during the construction work, works. To, to do this, um, we used specialist a vibration monitoring device that was placed on the bridge and recorded any movement. If the vibration had exceeded a trigger level of greater than 10 millimetres per second, it would have sent an alarm so that the works could be stopped. The actual vibration levels recorded were much less than the trigger level of around, at around 3 millimetres per second, apart from when someone kicked the box. Um, in August um, 2019 when it reached 25 millimetres per second um, and it set, set off the alarm. 
Flooding. Um, during the construction works, we had a record-breaking amount of rainfall and one of the wettest autumns and winters on record. These photographs show the massive amount of water in the river and why it's impossible to undertake further works. So this is these two photos give you a context of the fish pass itself um, and how it could completely be submerged um, during a flood event. Um, this is our access route uh, across the floodplain to the fish pass itself, which you can just about make out the construction plant in the distance. Um, same photo um, looking towards the fish pass um, when uh, immediately out, um, dur during the flood event. And final one, just to give you some context from an aerial view, this is Beverly Island and we're in the distance. Our fish pass is um, being constructed adjacent to the to the bridge that we can just about make out there. And this is the same area um, following um, following the winter floods. This chart shows the river levels over the past few years. The green line represents um, the water levels in the river during 2019. When the water level um, went above the straight brown line that you can see uh, shown on the chart, that represented the, the height of our cofferdam um, protecting the works. So as soon as the river level went above that, water would enter um, into the fish pass. You can see how unusual that was in 2019. You can see how, how um, how high the peaks of water flow were late in autumn 2019 um, and backed up by the, the, the record um, weather events um, that we had. Because of these floods we realised that we wouldn't be able to complete the works before winter and we decided to shut down the site um, until the end of March, early April. And then Covid-19 happened and when we wanted to return um, the country was in lockdown. This delayed our return for a few weeks whilst we developed new ways of working to ensure they could be completed in a COVID secure manner. So how do we do? The works were completed successfully, um, but around six months later than originally planned due to flooding and COVID-19. The fish pass became operational on 23rd of September 2020 with water flowing through the structure. This video gives some footage from that day. During the video, you may have noticed the dive team removing the small dam at the inlet. It's worth noting how easily they were able to stand up in the water against the flow. It looks from the surface that the water is fast flowing, but in reality, the forces and speeds are much less. I think it helps understand how it makes it possible for fish to swim up through the structure. Here are a few slides showing Beverly um, a few months after completion. You can see how well the grass is established and the concrete blocks are starting to weather after only a short time period has passed since finishing. I'm looking forward to visiting site over the next couple of years to see how natural it looks with the self-set trees and vegetation becoming established in the banks. For me this has been an amazing project to work on and I feel very lucky to have been involved in the design and construction of this fish pass which should remain working for at least the next 120 years. Thank you very much for listening. As I said at the start, this is a whistle-stop tour of building the naturalised bypass channel at Beverly Weir. Please also review my presentation um, covering the challenges of building the other three deep vertical slot fish passes on the River Severn. Um, I've covered quite a lot of areas. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you may uh, that you may have.
As noted at the start, please send these through to the event organisers and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much.